Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Burl, and I must begin tonight with a confession. I confess that I'm just a hometown, home state kind of girl. I was born in Junction City. My family then moved to Lake Elsinore, California, where we lived for about nine years. And then we came back to Topeka, where I had the blessing and the privilege to be raised by three wise, powerful women. And they taught me that if I was to follow in their footsteps, I would need to be able to cover not only the ground that I stand on, but also the ground that I stand in as a child of the dirt. You see, I must also confess that I believe that all humans were created from the dust of the earth, dirt. And as such, we are all common brothers and sisters. All of our colors can be found on what I like to call the sepia palette. We are all children of the dirt. Now, these three women were my grandmother, Lottie Turner Smith, my mother, Geraldine Thomas Smith Massey, and my great aunt, Oneva Smith Estes. They showed me through their daily walk, their love for others, their willingness to sacrifice and give of themselves, that they were powerful women, women to be reckoned with. Their activism may have been gentle, but their love was unlimited. And two of them, at least, cooked in a way that was generous for everyone. My grandmother was a great cook. My Aunt Neva was a great cook. My mama wasn't so great, but we didn't <laughs> die. <laughs> My grandmother loved to show her love for others through her cooking. And she didn't just show that to her family, but also to the sick and the shut-in who were not able to cook for themselves, to the hobos who would make their way to her and my grandfather's home on East 17th Street, just east of the railroad tracks, to students at Washburn University who lived in the sororities and the fraternities. She was a woman who, to me, cooked like no other. Her meals consisted of things like golden fried chicken, and wild greens, and pan cornbread, and desserts of sweet potato pie, and that was my personal favorite. Homemade vanilla ice cream, or breakfast of thick sliced bacon, over easy eggs, heavily buttered toast, and the best smelling Folgers coffee you could imagine. My grandmother loved to cook. She also loved to watch nature, and on June 8, 1966, she was sitting on her front porch watching the tornado as it moved across the park across from her home on East 17th Street and made its way to East Topeka. Now, we were all at our home at 2000 Maryland Street, cowering under furniture, crying and praying because we'd been trying to call her and hadn't been able to reach her. And later I found out that she had journaled everything she saw in her diary. I found this after her death. On the day that she died, she'd been out and about in our yard, puttering around with our family dog, picking some wild greens on the alleyway. And she'd come into the house. I was homesick that day. I was 15 years old. And she'd gone to a long drawer and a piece of furniture that she called a bureau. And she had taken out an envelope and said to me, now, Burl, when I die, this is where all my important papers are. And I said in my 15-year-old innocency, oh, Grandma, you're not going to die for a long time. She said, listen to what I'm telling you. When I die, this is where my important papers are. It was a Wednesday. That evening, she went to church with my mother, and at the end of the service, she'd gone up for prayer, sat in a chair, waited for the pastor to finish the altar call, come down and pray for her. But before he reached her, she was already dead. As I reflected on that, I thought about the power that she had to make a conscious choice, not only in the way that she lived and the way that she treated all people, regardless of their color or their station in life. She had the power to make a conscious choice about when and how she died. 
Now, my mother was a fascinating woman. She was the only child that my grandmother and grandfather had. And while they were a deep coffee bean brown shade on the sepia palette, she was a warm cappuccino. She graduated from Topeka High School, then attended Washburn University, but when the war began, she decided to do her part for the war effort. So she moved to Washington, D.C. to work as a secretary. When the war ended, she came back to Topeka, got a job working for the city as a secretary, and did that until she met and married my father. He was a pastor, and his first assignment was in Chattanooga, Tennessee, then in Kansas City, then in Junction City, where I was born, and then he moved the family to Lake Elsinore, California. His church in Lake Elsinore was made up of a variety of people of all racial backgrounds and all walks of life, and that was where I learned I was chocolate. A little boy came up to me, I was about five years old, and he began to lick my arm. And his father grabbed him, and he shook him, and he said, stop that. And the little boy began to cry, and he said, I thought she was chocolate. <laughs> well, I don't think I really had a strongly developed color consciousness at that time because I was more amused than I was afraid. But I believe it's because of how our parents raised us. You see, my mother's best friend in Lake Elsinore, California, was a woman that we called Aunt Irma. And for all we knew and all we believed, she was truly our blood aunt. However, she was as vanilla on the sepia palette as I was chocolate. But it made no difference whatsoever. In fact, she only lived down the road from us, but we would spend many weekends at her home. We all had our own pajamas there. We had our own toothbrushes and color-coded utensils because she was our aunt. And even when we moved to Topeka, I maintained correspondence with her close to the time that she died. And when I became an adult, she sent me a box of all my little kid things that she had saved over the decades. So you see, for us, based on how our mother had modeled her life in front of us, we learned very early that sisterhood is not based on color. It's based on love. Before my mother surrendered to cancer in 1971, she had been a secretary to many of the water commissioners in Topeka, one of them being uh, Charles Wright, who later became a beloved mayor and was always a very faithful family friend. She had helped uh, McKinley L. Burnett preserve his memoirs as the champion of the NAACP as its president during the Brown versus Topeka Board of Education case by typing them on one of those old black metal typewriters that we now see in museums. She had suffered a debilitating uh, illness coupled with a devastating divorce, but she never lost her impeccable character or her strength and her willingness to show love no matter what she went to, through. On the day that she died, I had been at the hospital with her most of the day and had come home exhausted from just watching her barely breathing and drifting in and out of consciousness. I'd laid down to go to sleep, and all of a sudden I heard her voice. And she said, I'm going now. I want you to be a good girl and get saved, and I'll see you later. And I thought to myself, I'm dreaming. That couldn't have been her, but the voice sounded so real. And so I said to myself, if it really was my mother passing from this world to the next, then someone will call me within 10 minutes. Of course, within a few minutes, the phone rang. I already knew. After my mother died, my aunt Oneva Estes became that mother figure for me. And I had received a full scholarship to go to the University of Minnesota, but my mother died in May. I left to go to Minnesota in September. It was too soon. I was still too emotionally damaged from the prolonged um, illness that she had suffered and I had suffered along with her, watching her die slowly of cancer. So when I got there, Minnesota, number one, was freezing cold. 
<laughs> Number two, I was so far removed from all family and close friends. And so one day my aunt called me and she said, I miss you. I need you to come home. And so would you please come home this spring? Now, of course, I knew she really didn't need me, but she provided for me the escape hatch that I needed to avoid a deep depression. She treated all of her nieces and nephews and every young person that she came into contact with in her work as a house mother and a cook for sororities and fraternities at Washburn, in her day work for certain families in Topeka that hired her to come in and do their house cleaning and their cooking, for all her nieces and nephews. She treated every young person. It didn't matter their station in life or the color of their skin or whether they were blood relatives or not. She treated every one of us as if we were her own children. She always said she wanted to live to be 90. So on her 90th birthday, I'd gone to visit her. She was at Manor Care due to an enlarged heart. I went and sang happy birthday to her, gave her a birthday card, which she opened and smiled, and her favorite perfume, and she took off the nozzle and sniffed it. Then she kissed me, and we sat, and we talked, and just enjoyed one another's company until one of my other cousins came. So I told her I'd leave for a while, let her enjoy their company, and then come back later to continue the celebration. But while I was gone, I got a call from my cousin to say that she had passed. What an amazing woman. What an amazing life. What an amazing ability to have such conscious control over your life that you can even say, Today is the day I'm going to die. And so I will live my life to my 90th birthday. And when I have reached that goal, I can feel free to pass on to be reunited with my husband and with my grandparents and with my mother and all of her loved ones that had gone on before her. So when I think about these three powerful women and even my own coming of age in sepia-toned Kansas, I also think about my favorite movie, the Wizard of Oz. And there are themes within that story that I think are so relevant to the concept of understanding that we are all children of the dirt, that there is no black or white on the sepia palette, that there is only a vast variety, variety of beautiful shades that encompass the skin colors of human beings. Because you see, when Dorothy was in sepiated Kansas, she had everything she, ne she needed, though she did not realize it. And it wasn't until she got to beautiful, colorful Oz that she and her companions recognized that color really didn't matter and that everything in that environment was manipulated by this wizard who was only using smoke and mirrors to deceive. And so as I thought about how sometime in our communities, individuals have been dece deceived by the concept of black and white and one greater than and one less than or one to be preferred and one to be denied. And if you really think about it, when you're applying it to the human skin tone, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Because if you were to look at true black and true white, you would notice that none of our skin colors match either of those colors. So I confess that I have no fixation on the colors of black and white when it applies to human skin tone. But I truly believe that as children of the dirt, we all are common. We are brothers. We are sisters, we share the same blood, and we deserve the same level of love and appreciation from one another. So in conclusion, I do want to also confess tonight that I hope I never become anything other than a hometown girl living in the hometown state of Kansas where I can enjoy my own sepiated identity but also recognize, embrace, and admire yours. Because in my heart and in my brain, I have the courage to boldly say to anyone who asks me, and even those who do not, that this is my land 
of ahas. I have come to realize that as a child of the dirt, I love each and every one of my brothers and sisters, and I hope that this confession will inspire you, my sisters and my brothers, to love me as well as all of our other sisters and brothers, all of us children of the dirt. Thank you for hearing my confession. <laughs> <laughs>